Thank you. I'm Shirley Beaulieu, the homeowner. And I'm Lynn McDonald, housemate. And I'm Robert, housemate. Yeah. That's it. Oh, well, do we go ahead now? Certainly, feel, feel free to proceed, thanks. Okay, we would like to make a request um, that you reconsider the fee that you're charging to read our meter. We uh, know that it's a legislation rule or however you want to term it that you have made, but uh, we feel that it's unreasonable and we do know that sometimes rules are made to be changed at times. Shirley would like to say that she's Go ahead and say about your reading experience of meters. I, uh, when I lived out in the country uh, for several years under Korea, Central Alberta uh, Rural Electrification, whatever <laughs> was the name of it, <clears throat> excuse me, I took the reading every month, even months that they came to read it themselves. And I never had any complaints only one time when I was a little bit late. And I know what I'm doing, and I've been an accountant for 42 years, and I would like to be able to read my own meter. I think I can read it just as well as anyone else. For free. Yeah. So this is our request. Um, we uh, understand, again, like you stressed, that it is your rule or your, and that we just like to make the, and we talk, when we talked with Chris Houston, he did tell us way back in June when we first spoke with him that he would consider or would be going to some committee. I, I think that's the way I remember him saying it, to discuss it with them. And I guess who that was was probably you guys with the council. And so we do know that there was a possibility that it can be waived or changed or however you want to do it. We do also know that before the smart meters, it was part of the, uh, the bill. monthly bill. It was not a fee to read the meters. We do know that there are still some that do not have a smart meter in town. So we would just like to uh, really uh, have the opportunity to read the meter ourselves and save us that fee. And how else we, should we say that, Shirley? Is there any other? I just think it's an unreasonable fee because I'd be happy to read it myself. And these other two guys with me, mm -hmm. they would be happy to do it if I happen to be gone. Mm -hmm. They'll do it. Mm -hmm. That's right. We, for better health, we'd be doing anything to, to facilitate it. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so I guess <laughs> we're not, we've never done this before, so I guess we've made our case. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, presenting to us. Uh, I substantially doubt that we're prepared to uh, offer any kind of a recommendation or proposed solutions to this this evening, but I I do want uh, you to understand and appreciate that this is precisely why we did move to uh, a smart meter was because of the cost involved. And while I can appreciate the fact that uh, you want to do things a little differently and, and you've got some concerns with the smart meters, which is fine. We did make allowances for them and to suggest that uh, the fee that was imposed is only for the reading of the meter is not entirely uh, accurate. There are other costs as far as the accounting and getting into the system. So uh, without belaboring the point, uh, the actual reading of the meter uh, is, is certainly a portion of that cost. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we can try and come up with a a, a suitable uh, arrangements. Um, this is, however, uh, a bit of a variance from what we have in place. So I just want you to understand that, however things go, that uh, uh, we try and do the best we can for the majority of our citizens. And sometimes um, the systems do not uh, tailor themselves to specific individual needs. But uh, certainly do appreciate you presenting to us, and we will take your uh, request under consideration. So thank you. Thank you. And just for clarification, we'd like to say that we do know that uh, they did not fee they did not have that fee before, 
and um, they read the meters without a fee at all. It was part of the service. And so we are willing to read it ourselves without the fee. That's our, that's our point. That's our stance. No, and understood, but as stated, that was precisely the reason why we went to the new type of meters is so that we did not have to uh, expend the man hours, which was substantial across the citywide um, utilities network. Uh, and that was the reason why we went to them. So um, there's really nothing, nothing else that I can add at this time. Okay, but well, thank you for your time. We appreciate your request. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Good time. Shirley Beaulieu, Lynn McDonald, Rob Sturbent is now exiting. Council. Forgive me, I was not uh, trying to be rude. I did not ask if there's any questions you had of the presenter. Or was there any clarification required on anything this time? All right. Councilor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Casey. Just a quick question. How many meters do we have out there that are? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have an exact count, but there are a number of meters that are inaccessible or due to their size or condition. Remain non reopened at this site. Um, those bylaws specific to non radio frequency water meter uh, reading charges in those areas where we are able to switch to a radio read. But um, from the request of the building owner, in this case, um, that they request that they not keep a radio frequency water meter. So there would be a number in the city, I would say one to two dozen probably throughout the city. Um, residential or commercial? Uh, mostly commercial. So very, very deep residential. And, and the concern here was safety on their part? Well, health and safety. Health yes. and safety. And we accommodated that by changing the meter out. Yes, the bylaw does contemplate that. Exactly. <laughs> And to account for the adverse sources required to get that single manual read, it's a 25 dollars charge. Okay, so that's where this is coming from. This addition is quite clear. So it's a 25 dollars a month charge to go for that reading. I think for the, for the read for the reading and the adjustment to the system. And, uh, well, there's it, multiple things that we're for sure. Anyone else? So be, before I call the meeting quarter, so we just got uh, completed with our open forum. Um, just to know where we're at, uh, Councillor Connick. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate you letting me know earlier as well. Uh, so it is uh, 508 and it will call this regular council meeting uh, to order for September 13th. We've got a agenda before you. Are there any additions or changes we need to contemplate? Councilor Hibbs? No changes. I would just really adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you. Anyone else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Next up, we do have uh, a presentation this evening from the Lacoma District Historical Society uh, regarding the Community Builder Partnership Grant. And we've got uh, Lantry Vaughn and Debbie Gillard here. Who's going to be speaking first? Debbie Vaughn. Welcome. 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 The uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, we're going to both speak to the, to the presentation tonight. I have to take this off to kind of this all up. Anyway, um, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Debbie Gillard, and I'm Vice President of the Lacoma District Historical Society, and with me is Lanty Bond, Society Secretary. And uh, we are here to present our case for the Community Builder Partnership Grant available from the city. 
We're very excited with our expansion into the Flatiron Building, and we're hoping to expand our opportunities to provide more value to residents of Lacombe and Lacombe County by being able to increase our programming and services to the community. We have slide two. Uh, funding from the partnership grant will enable us to move and upgrade our archives collection out of the basement of the Michener House and into the basement of Flatiron Building. Once the archives are moved, we would be able to provide more access for public use to increase the overall access to the collection by museum staff and volunteers. Um, if you look at this list, it's uh, List of the challenges that our society is facing at our current location. And this assessment was done, completed by the Canadian Conservation Institute in 2017 and 2018. And uh, we will touch briefly on each one of them. Um, the most uh, uh, important issue that we have is flooding. <laughs> Pardon me. I've been a member of the society for 21 years and we've had an issue three times flooding in that time. And it's been an issue for a long, as long as the museum has been open, our archives are held in the basement of the Michener House. And because of the way the plumbing was set up, when the house was originally renovated, the wastewater is sent to a holding tank at the back of the lot, and it's below the city sewer lines on the street. And this requires a, uh, a lift pump in the tank to bring the wastewater up and onto the main line. In the past 20 years, we've had three floods in the basement due to pump failure. There's no way of knowing that the pump has failed until the water backs up into the basement. The basement of the flat air building, in the other sand, is above city lines and is never flooded. And the basement floor is also the best available to handle the weight of the, the content of the art Slide. I think these pictures just about said everything you need to know about the basement and the extra problem. Uh, current view of the basement and the storage area and the fiction house. Pretty scary stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So the, we were assessed what and developed the building provides much better fire protection and provides brick exterior fire alarms, multiple fire extinguishers inside the structure, although not in the basement. And emergency lighting in the event of fire. So it's a much more suitable building. Almost any building would be more suitable than the oldest existing residential building. Next slide. So the studies that were done on the Michigan House, uh, there are fire extinguishers in, in the Michigan House, uh, and, but it's hard to get around in there. It's very crowded as you saw in the basement. There's no room to install just about anything, fire panel equipment, any sort of protective uh, measures. More space that would be available at the flat iron building will allow the society to accept larger artifacts like furniture that wouldn't fit. I don't know what you could fit into that basement. Uh, and also would reduce, reduce the risk of physical damage through less frequent handling and more efficient next slide. So the society is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year as keepers of the home district history. Uh, over the years, we've seen lots of uh, increased requests for research in the families, organizations, uh, local features, um, and but there's no real facility. People can't get in there, <coughs> let alone look through any of the archives. So the, the increased case of the flat iron means that but the archives would be more accessible, there would be research space, and it would be much more accessible to the public to come in and do their own research. Next okay, slide. Okay. These are the um, three. Oh, we added one, so I, my notes are wrong. Four basic goals for the project. Uh, one is to provide a better storage facility and allow for growth in the collection. And number two is to allow better archive access to the archives for all. This is a very important one. And to maintain a historical presence, 
downtown and to add more community value to a city based building. And we are also happy to support the City of Lacombe's downtown area revitalization plan. While this funding request is specific to the new archive collection space in Flatiron Building, a new history and art gallery spaces and event programming spaces are being created as well. This new cultural center we are creating in the heart of downtown Lacombe will positively and directly impact the community and bringing locals and tourists together. This will aid in the revitalization of downtown Fort Lacombe, where the Flatiron Building is located. The community has indicated through the DARP surveys feedback that it wants a lively down evening downtown. Using art and history exhibits, public access to museum collections and records, various events, galas, lectures, etc., and programs offered throughout the year, this project will create new jobs, draw tourists to the region, and energize downtown local home businesses with multiple close around 5 p.m. As an ally to the LGBTQ2 plus First Nation, Inuit and Metis, this space will become an economic a beacon of economic recovery, reconciliation, and community healing as the historical society continues to offer opportunities for all heritage, culture, and art groups within the city of Lacombe and greater Lacombe area to provide a new and dedicated safe space for all. Next slide, There's a series of slides here that show you typical uh, museum of three storage units that are pr proposed to install in the of the to go to the next slide. These are familiar if you've been in a library or archives. Um, they're designed by Westville Systems out of uh, Calgary, I believe, who is uh, offered to source the and install of at a reduced rate for society. You could go to the next one too. These are standard uh, museum grade storage facilities, which are very uh, space efficient because they all go together, as you've probably seen in lots of other places. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So here's the project timeline. And you should know we're just in the middle there, fall 2021, where we are in the, in the timeline. Probably seen it. You could go to the next one. So the cost for the installation was self quoted by Westville Systems is around $50,336. Uh, plus, there's about $30,000 needed for prepping the space, other technological equipment, uh, and other items, records, and storage things would be about $30,000 for a total of $80,336. We are asking for $20,398.73 from the city. Uh, we've applied for three other federal grants, Museums Assistance Program, Canadian Heritage Organizational Grant, and Canadian Cultural Spaces Grant that would cover the remainder of the costs for the installation of this equipment. And the line of line. This is, uh, this is our page saying thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council for taking the time to be our presentation and for your continued support in our efforts to preserve and promote the home's unique history. If you have any questions, we have been answered, we can. Thank you both for presenting, we appreciate it. Does anyone in the Council have media questions? Councilor Cock. Thank you, Mayor Lucio. In terms of the other sources of funding, how confident are you that you will get them? Applied for a number of grants. It's like you're looking to ask the Cohen County as well. Um, are you confident you will get the remainder of the funds you need? I honestly can't answer that question because <laughs> grants are grant. And I'm just a volunteer. Uh, Melissa is our grant writer expert, and she, unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight, and she would have a better idea of that than, than I would. I would just add the precedent for county and city. On very nothing like this. And I would say, knowing and having worked with Melissa for quite a while, she's very thorough. Uh, she does her work well and she understands what she's doing. And I'm, I have a lot of confidence. Of course, you can't say for sure which grant would be successful, but I am confident it would be not 
she's been sort of conservative in her estimates and realistic in, in my opinion. So we're confident, as confident as you can be in these times, that we probably will be able to avail the other one. Yeah, no, I was just, you know, it's terrific if you ask for this funds, but I, I'm just wondering if you might come back because there's a shortfall here, but that's all I was trying to answer today. Councilor Billington. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, yeah, thanks again for the presentation. I, I was trying to get in there the other day to take a look around and was unsuccessful, but uh, I think this is a great move and I certainly support it uh, completely to, to move down to the Flatiron building. Is there enough faith in the basement for you there to put this type of storage in? Compare, excuse me, compared to where it is now? Well, I'm, compared to where you are now, is like, it's horrible there. I've been down in that basement. It's not great at all. Flat iron building is much larger for sure. But for long term, are you looking at this storage space? Will this be adequate? Or you will still be storing some things at your current location. Is that not correct? We will be still storing some items. Um, in the last number of years, we've tried to, uh, uh, and we've made plans, and had plans uh, created to uh, open up a whole new building for our uh, museum. And so far, we, we haven't been successful to that, but it's it's still going to be always on the table because Lacombe, uh, all they have to do is look at Bentley Mirror. They have an actual building for a museum, and right now our hands are tied with the, with the Mitchell House. This is a five-year lease that within that time, perhaps we'll be able to gain funding or come from a different point where we can actually look at building a, an actual building, museum, museum building, uh, be it near the Minister House or in another spot in town. And all of the equipment that we are putting into the basement of the Flatiron building is not attached to the floor in any way. It, it's, it can all just be picked up and taken out. There's a piece at either end that's attached to walls, but the actual trapping, the, the rolling shelves run on the floor can apparently just be picked up and moved to another facility or for storage or whatever needs to be done. And we decided to move out in five years. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. And, and I think it's a great idea that you're looking, still looking at a new facility as additional storage and, and the place to showcase everything that you have, because I, we're not seeing it now, obviously. Well, and, and then that's part of the uh, of the main floor of what Flatiron Building is going to be used for is our, is to be, have better displays and uh, change them up frequently and, and be able, but that's the issue with the basement right now is trying to get in there to find stuff when you want it. It's just a nightmare because you have to move all this out of the way and get back in there and, and scurry through boxes and, and it's, so it's tough. And I know that we've had the students the last few years really working at uh, finding stuff because over the years we've got an accession register that says we have a great listing of all of these things that have been donated, but going down and finding them, half the time we couldn't. So they've been finding the issue or finding the items, taking photos of them, and we're putting it to a electronic program past perfect so that A, we know what they look like when we go to find them and to put a note in there saying get us on shelf number three, you know, spot A or whatever. So that it, uh, it's making our our job a bit better. I'm looking forward to seeing the changes and I hope it uh, happens soon. Thank you as well. <laughs> Any other questions? In your uh, report, you had identified a couple uh, potential issues that exist in the current building, both with fire and the flood. I'm just curious, are there more appropriate systems uh, have, or have there been more appropriate systems added to the flat iron building to this point? Or is this something that you need to do in addition to this, to the uh, uh, shelving display and secret over here? I think we're going with the existing right now, because I think it was in the slide, I mentioned the, the different uh, uh, sprinkler systems that things are already in the flat iron building. We wouldn't be adding at this time anything because we don't want sprinkler in the basement floor where the archives are. But the other part already has the sprinklers in it already. But there are, are uh, fire uh, extinguishers that are uh, checked uh, 
frequently whenever the, there's a schedule of fire extinguishers when they need to be checked and see if they need to be recharged and things like that. And, and the ones in the modern bar on a schedule for that. The ones in the Michener house are as well, but it's just the access, I guess the fire broke out in that zoo down there, trying to begin to, but it, the fire extinguisher is all we have for fire protection in the, in the house. But just, I just add the basic structure and infrastructure in the Flatiron building, which has been renovated over the last maybe 15, 20 years, maybe, automatically, under time spent there in the budget, not I'm sure there must be some coal that was, that it was, uh, when it was redone, that what they would have had to adhere to. Thank you. And once again, it's a, you're proposing to use both locations then, I assume? Yes. Just so that we are clear, that location does have a water sensor and whatnot in the basement now, given there has been a history of some flooding issues? Yes, um, we have actually, this just this past year, uh, gotten a new security system put in with Pallas, and that is one of the things in that is that was included in the new, uh, was for, I, I don't know whether there's something down there. I know that Melissa said that that uh, gives a uh, warning when there's moisture in the basement. Very good. I would certainly hope that there was, but nice to have it known publicly as well. So thank you. Anyone else? Thanks once again to you both. Thank, thank you. you very much. We don't have any public hearings this evening. We'll move right into requests for decision. And that is the uh, First item up uh, after this presentation is 5.1, the Community Builder Partnership Grant. But my notes, it does say manager steward. I'm assuming that uh, Director Point is uh, going to fill in. That's correct. Very good. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Precinct Council. This evening, Council is asking to complete the Home and District Historical Society's application to the Community Builder Fund. As you've just heard, the Historical Society recently decided on a move to the Flatiron Building to develop an upgraded archive and collections facility. The Society has asked for $20,398.73. We'll make for a safer venue with proper shopping and a permanent public good accessible research support to banks. Approved, the Society will look for a matching grant from the county and turn use those funds to secure a more significant federal balance of over $115,000 or are adequate funds available to support the application. Further, the request is in line with the Community Builder Partnership Policies requirement that any application will not exceed 25% of the total project cost. The project aligns with the Community Builder Partnership top priority sectors and stated timelines. And in light of the program fit and stated community value, the administration has recommended council approve the Lacoma District Historical Society grant application open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Councilor Hoekstra. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, so when I was reviewing this, I, I was trying to remember, so we we give funding to the Historical Society. We are supplementing the lease or we are carrying the lease of the Flatiron Building, is that correct? And then now it'll be the community, or this um, grant from the Community Builder Partnership Fund. I guess I just wanted to know how much are we for funding the society currently? Um, Even though I'm totally in favor of this, but I just needed to know those numbers. So we do not summarize it uh, in the request for council decision here. I believe the amount is $42,000 on an annual basis for the historical study and the operating grant. Um, the lease is $3,000 a month, so $36,000 a year. Although there is some recovery from the Columbia Regional Tourism Division and all of that. So I think there's about four or five thousand dollars to take back at that point. So, um, and then there's this one time funding here, but on an annual basis, we'd be talking about 70 to 70. Councillor Ross, I can make this out. This is uh, make the most sense to me that Council approves a grant of. $20,398.73 from the Community Building Fund to the Macomb and District Historical Society for their development of archive and collection storage in the Flatiron Building. Thank you. Any 
anyone else wish to speak to that motion? Councilor Gibbs. Just a quick question. Um, now, so we are going to potentially um, give this grant for a specific project. Should the project project not proceed, as in they're i.e. not able to get further grants, um, does this money come back, or was the society planning on holding on to that and to on the idea that it would happen in the future, or do we have any direction on that? I suspect that we have not released the dollars until the end. Perfect. Great. That's the answer I want here. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, and that's a very good question. Considering how it's worded uh, for the development of the archive and collection storage building, I think that would be reasonable to either be certainly be a paired back installation. Should they not? Should some of the other funds not be forthcoming? Um, right. So they perhaps would alter the request. Although again, there would be a significant change there. And again, the application guideline statement is twenty five percent of the project. So the right. And I, I think it is a reasonable request given that to be ashamed not to see or to see it fail simply because the city was unable to uh, fill this portion of the grant and, and enable them to continue on with the federal funds and uh, hopefully for considering the county as well. So, Chief Tony, just to add to that, the actual policy does require that. 100% of the funds being placed prior to the project completing, so they were uh, able to find sources other than the city to move the project ahead. They would have to modify and come back to amended approval or wait until they could find uh, other sources. Anyone else? Okay, on that motion, of course, then all those in favor? That is uh, unanimous. Thank you. Councillor Jacobson, appreciate you joining us electronically. Yep, thank you. And next up, we have Manager Mitchell with us. He's here in person. Wonderful. Uh, Five point two, Ben Thompson Drive, paving tender award. Good to see that we're going to have that road all paved this year. That's good to see that <laughs> coming out. But not be an awesome update. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor Ducey, and good evening, members of council. For you tonight is yet another update on the Lens Thompson Drive Fifth Avenue Community Project. Uh, this project was approved by council on the, at the August 9th meeting on the condition that the all in project crop did not exceed the budgeted $1.7 million, or $1,770,800. Uh, the project was tendered on July 29th and closed on August 19th. And five contractors submitted bids for all in good order. The lowest bid was uh, from DB Bobcat Services for uh, $1,667,193. This was 0.33% lower than the second lowest bid, which is a very close market of about $5,500 on an a over $1.5 million project, and about 1.4% uh, higher than the engineers would be to their estimates. The bid numbers shown in Table 1 of this memo include a $2,500 per day charge for the occupancy. Uh, so this is what we use to factor in the cost of engineering inspection costs to the total price for preparing bids. A contractor can complete the work quickly, bids a low number of site occupancy days, which results in a, in a lower price overall. Uh, the contractors can take longer to complete the work, get a higher number of days, and so this is reflected when the engineer submits their view for field inspection. So we take out the site occupancy and substitute that in with the uh, engineer's actual cost of uh, site inspection after the tender closes. Um, there also is incentive to stay on time. So should DB Bobcat finish their work sooner than the number of days they did, they would be awarded a $2,500 day bonus. Uh, and ultimately, an equivalent amount would be reduced. Stand X25. And vice versa, if they go over the number of days, we can charge them for $2,500 per day for every day that they're over and we use that to pay for the inspection. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is on a bid this tight, um, $5,500 in difference of two days can, can make that difference. Uh, once site occupancy was deducted from the bid and materials testing, uh, engineering and shallow utility relocates were included in the cost. 
the overall project cost was over the previously approved budget. Administration re reviewed the project and removed any provisional items to reduce the contingency from 10% down to 5% to bring it as close to budget as possible. However, it was still over. The tender did include optional pricing for installing a curb and asphalt trail um, along the, the portion of the road that was being paved. Um, the competitive pricing included in the tender leads administration to recommend constructing the trail from the Mill Creek Drive to the fish pond um, along with the road work at the cost of $43,560. However, if that uh, isn't approved, administration will be bringing the proposal back to council to include the trail connection all the way from Highway 2A to the fish pond uh, later this fall. The following project cost, including the uh, asphalt trail, is now estimated to be 100, uh, or sorry, one million eight hundred eighty-five thousand nine hundred dollars, which requires transfer of two hundred seventeen thousand four hundred eighty from the road reserve. If the asphalt trail is removed, the project cost can be reduced to one million eight hundred forty-two thousand three hundred forty-seven dollars. Uh, $347, which requires the transfer of $169,561 from the road reserve. And I will note that at the August 9th council meeting, council did approve a transfer, already approved transfer of $104,000. So this represents approximately $113,000 for the asphalt trail or $65,000 not including um, the asphalt trail as a, as a cost difference and this update. Um, the local improvement tax will not be applied to the cost of bridges, and the city will pay 100% of those, as I previously mentioned. Questions? Thank you, Manager Mitchell. Um, one question that I had we did discuss some drainage issues. Uh, I think that were rather problematic for a few of the landowners in that area. Uh, have those issues been addressed within uh, this budgetary figure? Yes and no. Uh, so some of the issues are on private property, and so those we can't fully address, but we have tweaked the engineering drawings to best facilitate the best possible outcome for those lots. Um, one in particular is the, the Wolf Creek building supply. Their, their lot is substantially low. It is in the flood fringe zone, and the groundwater table is literally like inches below the surface. Um, without them building up the site, it's, it's virtually impossible to fully address that. We have been out, we've talked multiple times with the owners. We'd like to know what we're doing. And basically, what we will be doing is you'll be containing all future road inflow um, from flowing onto their sites if they're not contributing to the problem. And we have lowered the road as much as we physically can with still making the connection to the creek and dropping as, as low as possible to help improve that problem. That said, will they still likely experience some wet spots in the spring? Likely, yes, until they, they make some repairs. Up. But we won't be contributing to the issue. Very good. So, should they choose to install a pumping system, uh, for instance, is the infrastructure in place for us to be able to uh, carry that water away from the property? Yeah. So our our infrastructure is all going to be ditches. So if they can get it to the ditch, we'll be able to to move it away. The the best bet probably for them would actually be to to build up their sites some so that that it sheds better towards the ditches that were already in place. Very good. Councilor Cock. Thank you, Mayor Chris. I'll make the motion that Council authorizes the administration to avoid the construction of the Maybe Bobcat Services, construction monitoring and inspection services, materials testing services, department deal for all the point costs of one point eight hundred eighty five thousand nine. Thank you, Councillor Connick. Any additional comments? Good. I don't recall any other instances where we've had bids, the top three bids that are quite as close as there in this one. It's good to see that the process is working. I think all three of those companies have done a substantial amount of work for the city, and I think it's nice to see here, to see uh, local uh, companies uh, come out on top. So great to see. If there is nothing further, 
respect to that motion, I will call the question. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thanks, Manager Mitchell. Thank you. Director Pichet, item 5.3, the corporate identity policy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary Creasy. The work out for this evening is the corporate identity policy. This policy will guide staff and the public on using corporate identifiers for the city of Lacoa. In September of 2003, council adopted the armorial bearings that create, was created by the Chief Herald of Canada. This includes the coat of arms, the crest, the flag, the motto, and the badge. The army of bearings is used as official symbols uh, for, of the city. That includes specific cer ceremony items, the mayor's correspondence, the mayor's promotional items, and correspondence with any legal importance. In August of 2011, the city, uh, city council approved the current brand, which includes the artistic tree, the specific fonts that we use now, and colors, which we use to market the city. This artistic brand is a symbol that is separate from the coat of arms or the armorial bearings, and is intended to bring the community together and foster a sense of pride. This new policy that's been created amalgamates the coat of arms um, and the artistic brands and any other department logos into one guiding document. The armor, the armor of bearings uh, or the coat of arms policy is still very relevant. Therefore, the, wor the wording of that policy is included pretty much verbatim in this new, law, new policy. Administration also recommends that council rescinds the previous um, um, army oil bearings and policy to ensure that there is no link to bring redundancies that will exist. The corporate identity policy will guide staff and the public on how to use the city logos, attaining permission to use the city logos and the appropriateness of their use. There is also some guidance in the policy to determine if a department should develop its own logo. At this time, administration recommended that Council approves the 12-017.01-2021 PO Corporate Identity Policy as presented and rescinds Policy 11-210.02-2015 PO Armiel Bearings the Code of Arms Policy. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Councilor Goldson. Thank you, Mayor Casey. I'll move that council approves the 12 slash 017-012021 PO corporate identity policy as presented. Do I have any questions or concerns? All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Creasy, the move of Council Sings Policy 11 slash 210.02-2014 PO Armoral Ferries Coat of Arms Policy. Those hand in hand with Perkman. Thank you for that. Anyone? All those in favor? Director Pichet, you're in separate role. You might as well continue with the uh, uh, <laughs> data, data integrity. Sure. Thank you. Before council this evening is the fifth and final batch of policies in the policy cleanup project at this time. To date, council has rescinded 1,142 policies since the start of this project. Tonight, there are, all, are only 140 policies listed to rescind. And each policy has been reviewed and are deemed inoperative, obsolete, expired, spent, superseded, or otherwise ineffective. Although this is the final match in this project, future policies should be rescinded within the policies that they're replacing. However, moving forward, we will be conducting a yearly review of any policies that may require cleanup, which will be brought to Council at that time for approval. 
evening. Administration is requesting that council rescinds all policies identified as an operative obsolete, expired, spent, superseded, or otherwise ineffective in the attached listing. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer the rest. Thank you, Director Pichet. I guess just wanted to once again touch the fact that all of these obsolete uh, inoperative uh, policies, whatnot, we still have track of them for uh, of all the, of all the documentation for historical purposes. A hundred percent, they are. Uh, these are permanent records still within the the city. They're just not in our active policies after this anymore, but they are still. Uh, kept forever in our in our uh, records. Very good. If for no other reason, I think it's interesting to follow through how some of the policies and whatnot progress throughout time. So, thank you for making that uh, public as well. Councilor Hoogstra. No, I went and changed my page. Thanks, Mayor Cousy. Um, I'll make the motion that Council rescind all policies identified as inoperative, obsolete, expired, spent, superseded, or otherwise ineffective in the attached old city. Thank you. See any hands, all those in favor? Thank you. That was all that we required in that particular item, was it not? Okay, next up, let's move into uh, the administrative reports and the quarter two uh, report for 2021. Senior Manager McKinnon, can you hear us? There you are. I can hear you. Very good. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Creasy and Council. Tonight, I'm here to present to you the second quarter variance report for 2021. In the revenues, you'll notice the first six months of 2021 revenue, we had a shortfall of 211,000. There's three factors that contribute to this deficit. Uh, first of all, we had a $375,000 deficit in revenue related to rentals and programming uh, in recreation facilities, mostly 100% due to COVID closures. There was also an offsetting uh, surplus in other revenue sources, and this included some unbudgeted revenue for one-time items, such as the Fortis Advance for street light work, GST audit rebate, municipal climate action change grant, and also $150,000 in proceeds for sale of vehicles and equipment, which will be offset by a transfer to reserves. Also, there was a year-to-date surplus in tax revenue collected of $50,000. On the expenditure side, there is a $1.4 million surplus in the first six months of 2021. The three main contributors are, uh, number one, there's a $552,000 surplus due to regional wastewater services, partially due to timing, and also there is a lower than budgeted expenditure, of roughly about $224,000. There's also a surplus in goods and services, partially, again, due to timing, and also uh, savings resulting from the facility closures. And finally, there's a surplus in personnel resulting from some police savings as well as facility closures and layoffs. Overall, the second quarter variance is $1.2 million surplus, which we expect to decrease in the next six months of 2021. The next variance report is a third quarter variance report and will be presented to Council in November. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oddly enough, and it's good news, not a lot of questions. <laughs> I do not see any questions. Perhaps, uh, <laughs> Councillor Connor, go ahead. Well, I was just going to make a motion. Perfect. Also, move that Council accepts this report. Appreciate that. All those in favor? Great. Gotti, did you have a report for us this time? Yes, I did. So starting off with um, some discussion of COVID, the city of Macomb there at the time floor was at 61 cases and continued to rise in cases as anticipated by the time. We 
do continue to meet regularly to talk about the best way to mitigate risk of transmission within the staff and at our city facilities. We're not getting access to any facilities at this time. And although at the time of bringing this, I said the volunteers of distinction event was to continue under a slightly modified format, um, we have made the decision to much more modified individual acknowledgement of volunteers, which is definitely regrettable, but uh, we think it is the, the safer option. Uh, and I would say there's a, a reasonable expectation that there will continue to be case increases for the next so at least until we see some of the new Excellent the new restrictions are in place. Administratively, um, we were able to have employee barbecue and the Cockroach Council and some of those larger events during the spike we had. Um, and we welcomed the Governor of Alberta, Minister of Culture, to kick off the four days of employment since Railway improvements are planned at 46th Avenue Crossing um, this fall for the CP Rail, which is uh, exciting. Thank you for that. The utility side you may have noticed uh, a couple of garbage bins that we are piloting some final wraps on. Um, they look very sharp, but of course, we want to see how they hold up to the cost of those wraps. And we Continue to Home County. We're excited to uh, be moving ahead with fire services with we'll some of the implementation from there. I know we have a meeting shortly with, with the ICM. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Regarding the improvements to the railway crossings, will that affect any of the speeds or whistles in our community when they do these improvements? Um, not directly, because this is a 46th Avenue crossing. There is some improvements required at other crossings prior to apply for whistle cessation. Um, speed will be unaffected by the completion of these as they're currently not under restriction. They are up to a full speed. We all continue to be able to do that when these improvements are in place. But this cessation does require these upgrades. So this is one step, one of the final steps, actually. Uh, there's one other cross that requires upgrades. Yeah, that bell's on this looks at the uh, and then we hope to work with the county, we have been working with the county, I should say, to look at the requirements of the whistle cessation and across the north of the city, because although that's also our jurisdiction, there's certainly an impact to our residents of that place. Thank you. Did that? Councillor Clark. Sorry, if I may, further to that, so the bells and whistles at Wolf Creek, is that safe to happen this year or is that next year? Or do we know? Uh, we don't have confirmation on the timing of those upgrades, so let's see if that's confirmed. Not, nothing recently. It's only the CP is uh, in the design phase, and so we're waiting for them to schedule the work. That's your question. Thank you, Mary Chris. We're speaking with CP. Uh, they're doing a lot of work in the area right now and pulling out a lot of railway ties as their file is going to get bigger on the south end and being notified at all. Unfortunately, they don't provide us that sort of notification. They um, did notify us they were going to remove it. Yes, they did. Do you need to go? Yes, that summer, I believe, was the uh, indication. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I, I I can't say one way or the other, but history says it will It'll get bigger. <laughs> Any other questions? Councillor Hibbs? Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, just a question about meeting with the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs. Um, was that something that was like a regular plan schedule thing, or was there a specific issue that was driving um, that meeting? Like, had that come to be? Um, actually, the Deputy Minister was meeting with various CAOs of the province, and the range reached out to the range for 
agreed to discuss general issues. Um, so the last COVID cases, we did change that um, to more of a virtual thing at the last day before, so it was a bit less fruitful than we had hoped um, if it was in person, but it was still a valuable. And is this something that has happened regularly in the past that you've met um, with the deputy minister? I cannot think of a time that this happened in the past. This was uh, this Cox was, was new to the portfolio, and then she's trying to establish those relationships. So I'm just questioning because it does seem a little unusual. Not a bad thing. In fact, it's a very good thing. Um, deputy ministers are quite important in the grand scheme of things, and we they often get overlooked because they're not they're not political, right? They're administrative. But that, that's, thank you for answering my questions. Additional questions for uh, Chief Cody. Very good. Uh, and 6.3 for the Commission and Board reports and minutes from the Local Police Commission minutes of June 17th. Any questions or concerns there? Councillor Hoekstrap. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. I just have a concern that vaccination rollout was reported in their minutes. That might have been something that was discussed, but the public reads these minutes and I feel there's an implication that they're supposed to report on vaccination rates and I I just argue that that shouldn't be in the minutes. Thank you. Anyone else? Next up, uh, item B, the Coleman Regional Tourism Minutes, July 13th. Playing a little catch up with the uh, MPC. It's always good to see that there are developments occurring in our city from July 21st, August 4th, and August 18th. Are there <laughs> any uh, Questions, comments, or concerns with any of those three sets of minutes? And then we can move into council reports. Councilor Gloxon, would you care to begin? Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, my Report is there as presented. Uh, for me, the highlights uh, certainly was the Comb Days, a uh, very successful event and greatly appreciated by our community. And I'm glad we were able to do it when we did. And uh, also the farmers markets, which I felt were very uh, informative and I enjoyed uh, engaging with citizens and tourists alike. And uh, it was very Pleasing to me to hear all the positive comments about our city from outsiders. Uh, it certainly uh, was a very positive experience for myself. Thank you. So, Ross, uh, no report this time. And Councillor Hoopstra. Thanks, Mark Creasy. Um, I'll have a report at the end of the month, but I did want to comment because I don't think it has been mentioned um, that. The flowers in the city were particularly stunning this summer and considering how hot it was, I, I just wanted to commend the city staff for watering them just right. And I know that seems kind of minor, but it's not. It, it, they were gorgeous and I, I just wanted to pass on thanks for those beautiful flowers. That's good. Um, just before I comment on my own, I would echo that actually. I actually took pictures while I was at the LMC maybe a week or two ago. I had to put them on Instagram because I was just so blown away by just the quality and, and just how everything looks. And, and obviously that reflects well on our city, it's people that are visiting here as well as people that live here. So yeah, again, I would echo that as well. Um, I don't have a written report. I definitely will have one at the for our next meeting. I did miss the deadline, unfortunately. Um, the only thing that I would probably highlight uh, as far as at least recent is I was lucky enough to be able to attend the Flags of Remembrance um, Day Ceremony um, over the weekend. 
And um, for those that have not had a chance yet to go and see the display that's on Highway 12 um, next to Pentagon, I think it's um, pretty phenomenal. Each of those flags obviously represents a group of people, but it also represents um, a specific person. So it would be worth it even if we walk the path and look at the various plaques. But I, I'm really proud that our city has such a display in our community. And uh, I, again, I'll just echo the fact that I just felt really um, lucky to be there. So that's all I would comment on. Thank you. Councillor Jacobson. Thank you, Councillor Connick. Well, my report is there. Take any questions. One thing I did want to just briefly, I, um, speaking of kudos to the city, um, 10th, they did the annual electronics recycle at the public concern. And I got off a couple of TVs, and they were very efficient. Proficient. I sat in the car, and they wouldn't even let me out. They just said, Well, oh, you just sit there, we'll grab your stuff. A very friendly instrument. That's all I have. Thank you. So a few items that I had uh, here to make sure the do about was our meeting with Minister Madhu, the Minister of uh, Justice, Solicitor General, myself, uh, members of our administration, Councillor Connick, members of the Lacan Police Service and Police uh, Commission that uh, I would say went rather well. Without any specifics, I would suggest that uh, there is a strong consideration for furthering the idea of, of a uh, provincial police force, and hopefully that will go uh, a long ways in alleviating some of the concerns that have been expressed repeatedly by our rural neighbors for policing. Someone did mention the kickoff for Alberta Culture Days, Minister Orr at the local research center, and of course the uh, Lights of Remembrance uh, so this Saturday. Uh, I would agree with Councillor Hibbs, it was uh, pretty spectacular for the, especially for the flag reveal there. And uh, in as much as our community is known for its generosity and whatnot, I think it's uh, needs to be said the amount of uh, work and effort and commitment that went in from uh, the owner of that facility there at uh, Pentagon Farm Supply. So I say publicly, as I did that day, special thanks to uh, friend and Debbie Williams for really stepping up and uh, ensuring that that event could have the, the uh, home that it deserves. I think it looks pretty outstanding. That's the entrance in one of the four entrances into the city. And uh, municipal related, but uh, far less work oriented, also attended an APCO Equestrian Masters Championship event where I did learn about hydrogen fuel. And that was the only work that was involved. So, just to be honest, with you, but, uh, I think that uh, much. Is organic waste always gets. I just wanted to inform everyone that the regional service has had some discussions um, that are certainly not formal, but uh, hopefully they will lead to something positive for dealing with uh, organic center waste stream. Not really prepared to elaborate on it this time, but uh, quite often just because we don't report on or have it in our agenda. I think people think that uh, we're not looking after certain items and we do pursue leads and and uh, to take those types of issues seriously. So we will see where it comes from and hopefully we'll have something uh, positive to bring forward over the next few months. Is that a, a big enough summation? That's all that I have for today. Any additional questions for anyone on the reports? If not, I think that concludes the information portion. Councillor Hibbs. I move that council receive all reports and correspondence as information. Thank you. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you.
And while we're on information, our minutes from August 9th, has everyone had an opportunity to review? Are there any omissions or revisions? Councilor Hoekstra. Thanks for Creasy. Uh, I mean, we accept the minutes as presented. Very good. No one has anything. We will vote them. All those in favor? It's unanimous as well. Thank you. No notice of motion this evening. Uh, our next meetings. September 27th, we do have a regular uh, council meeting. In this room at 5 p.m. And forgive me. Who is the deputy mayor at this time? As a service fair morning, and that uh, we'll be training that meeting. We're going to make it that well. I think I, um, I will not be here. And then again on Monday, October the fourth, at 5 p.m. Here another regular meeting, and then the first meeting after the election, the organizational meeting on Monday, October 25th, 5 p.m. in this room. So. Um, hopefully we'll all need those on our calendars as well. Your reaction. So that brings us back to. Section 9, the in-camera items, and before we go there, is there any items other than in-camera items that we have not uh, dealt with thus far? We're all good? Very good then. If someone would care to make a motion, 